Hello, and welcome to the eighth session in our extended reality lecture series, where we will discuss how to use what we have learned in our previous sessions regarding lighting and ray tracing in order to light a scene properly, but for real-time rendering. So the first thing we have to take into consideration when constructing our scene illumination setup is the target media. This means that we have to take into consideration the device we will be using to display our renders in real time. If the target media is a smartphone, the hardware specifications do not possess a strong enough GPU, which limits the entire process from henceforth. Therefore, the number of calculations needs to be reduced or optimized. On the other hand, if we intend to use a VR headset, we have the advantage of a faster rendering time based on GPU's presence in the hardware, which can provide a 2K image at 60 frames per second. As can a PC setup, which can fit even better performing hardware components for an even better result, less rendering time and more realistic depiction. This raises a question, is it better to invest into a game console, which has high capabilities for rendering realistic real-time ray-traced images for VR headsets, or is it better to invest into a PC whose computational power and performance can be used for VR applications, but which can be used for a myriad of other tasks, making it more versatile? After we have determined the target media based on our project requirements and criteria, we can take a look at the renderer basically choosing between a deferred or the forward renderer. Renderers are the graphics rendering pipelines that can be programmable, which is to say the pixel shading part can be governed by custom written shaders, including the vertex shader, the geometry shader, and the fragment shader. The deferred renderer is the default in Unreal Engine and is screen oriented. So it stores everything in screen space where geometry calculation is done first and then the pixels are shaded. Deferred shading is based on the idea that we defer or postpone most of the heavy rendering, like lighting, to a later stage. Deferred shading consists of two passes. In the first pass, called the geometry pass, we render the scene once and retrieve geometrical information from the objects that we store in a collection of textures called the G-buffer. The geometric information of a scene stored in the G-buffer is then later used for more complex lighting calculations. As opposed to that, the forward renderer is where the graphics card is supplied the geometry. It projects and breaks it down into vertices, and then those are transformed and split into fragments or pixels that get the final rendering treatment before they are passed onto the screen. It was developed with VR in mind. Lighting is the main reason for going one route versus the other. In a standard forward rendering pipeline, the lighting calculations have to be performed on every vertex and on every fragment in the visible scene for every light in the scene, thus wasting a lot of fragments, shader, runs, and time. The following image is a scene with 18,047 point lights rendered with deferred shading, something that wouldn't be possible with forward rendering. Once we are familiar with the media and the renderer choice, we can turn our attention to the various types of lights that will be used in real-time applications within Unreal. The first one is the directional light. So the directional light simulates light that is being emitted from a source that is infinitely far away. This means that all shadows cast by this light will be parallel, making this the ideal choice for simulating sunlight. A spotlight emits light from a single point in a cone shape, with two parameters for shading the light, the inner and the outer cone angle. Within the inner cone angle, the light receives full brightness while the intensity diminishes going to the outer cone angle, like a penumbra or softening around the disk of illumination. A point light works much like a real world light bulb emitting light in all directions from the light bulb's tungsten filament. However, for the sake of performance, point lights are simplified down to emitting light equally in all directions from just a single point in space. Due to its emission direction, a point light is depicted as six spotlights, making the computational process more expensive. The final light type is the sky, which is the only type that does not emit photons. The skylight captures the distant parts of the level and applies that to the scene as a light. That means the sky's appearance and its lighting reflections will match even if the sky is coming from atmosphere or layered clouds on top of a skybox or distant mountains. 
The skylight can be useful for illuminating the exterior scene. However, when using it as a main source of interior lighting, it can cause subpar results due to the small size of the opening and a vast amount of light being scattered elsewhere. When light mass is building the light, the light mass portals tell light mass that more light rays should come from this area, yielding higher quality light and shadows. And the last thing we should discuss is the light mobility, which is to say the ability of light to influence our interaction with the scene. The first type is the static light, which cannot be changed or moved in any way at runtime. Static lights tend to have medium quality, lowest mutability, and the lowest performance cost. When talking about static light, we have to introduce the light mass, which creates light maps with complex light interactions like area shadowing and diffuse interreflection. Light maps store the lighting information and are packed into textures. They are used to pre-compute portions of the lighting contribution of lights with stationary and static mobility lights. An important aspect of making light maps is the unwrapping and packing process. For example, if the entire geometry is broken down into essential elements, the GI calculation can cause artifacts. While considering the less seams and more connected unwrap can produce a more uniform calculation and avoid harsh transitions between different parts of the geometry. Coming back to light maps, each light map is a collection of HDR textures, but it does not store only the light intensity, but the light direction as well. With these two maps, it is possible to create more complex normal maps for depicting realistic geometry and material depth. When using light maps, it is important to address the light map resolution, which enables setting the default texture resolution for the baked light and shadow texture generated by light mass during a lighting build. This resolution will be used for all instances of this static mesh placed in a level. With a larger resolution, you can have more samples to calculate the shadow. Also, adequate resolution can be given to different geometries based on their importance and size within the scene, thus saving on the computational time. Since static lights only use light maps, their shadows are baked prior to gameplay. The main advantages are that they have GI, they use cheap, soft shadows, and are less GPU demanding. However, every time a change is made, the scene needs to be rebaked, which makes slower iterations and is more memory heavy. The next type of light based on mobility is called the stationary light. So stationary lights are lights that are intended to stay in one position, but are able to change in other ways, such as their brightness and color. This is the primary way in which they differ from static lights, which cannot change in any way during gameplay. However, it should be noted that runtime changes to brightness only affect the direct lighting. Indirect or bounced lighting, since it is pre-calculated by the light mass, will not change. So stationary lights tend to have the highest quality, medium mutability, and medium performance cost. Finally, there are movable lights. Movable lights cast completely dynamic light and shadows. They can change position, rotation, color, brightness, fall off, radius, and other properties. None of the light they cast gets baked into the light maps and do not support indirect lighting without a dynamic global illumination method. So one way to produce indirect lighting with dynamic lights is to use volumetric light maps. So while a light mass generates surface light maps for indirect lighting on static objects, dynamic objects can receive indirect lighting as well by storing pre-computed lighting in all points in space called a volumetric light map at build time and then used for interpolation at runtime for indirect lighting of dynamic objects. The way it works is that light mass places lighting samples throughout the level and computes indirect lighting for them during the lighting build. When it comes time to render a dynamic object, the volumetric light map is interpolated to each pixel being shaded, providing pre-computed indirect lighting. This can cause a large difference for a moving character or geometry within a scene if the lighting is supposed to create indirect illumination, which realistically depicts the light behavior in real time. So once we are clear on the type of media we want to use, the graphics rendering pipeline and shaders in reference to the amount of lights in the scene, the type of lights based on their direction and movability, we can take a look at how to prepare a scene for lighting. First part is the auto exposure. 
So the post-process volume provides controls for setting up automatic exposure, more commonly called eye adaptation, which automatically adjusts the exposure of the current scene view to become brighter or darker. This effect recreates the experience of human eyes adjusting to different lighting conditions. Like when walking from a dimly lit interior to a brightly lit exterior or the other way around. This phenomenon can be seen here in Unreal Engine and turning this feature off will ensure that you can adjust proper lighting without constantly changing camera exposure. The second thing is the screen space ambient occlusion and screen space reflections. These components darken the shadows and the reflections, and by turning them off, you can exactly know how they will look like in the final result. The tone mapper should be kept at default, where the purpose of the tone mapping function is to map the wide range of high dynamic range colors into low dynamic range that a display can output. This is the last stage of post-processing that is done after the normal rendering during post-processing. Uh, the process of tone mapping can be thought of as a way to simulate the response that film has to light. And in the end, no vignetting or bloom. They should also be turned off. With these elements of post-processing volume, we can turn to the material choice, which comes down to four basic materials to test the light interaction and behavior with. The first one is the black material. But we have to be careful to avoid the extreme values such as 0 and 1 when choosing the diffuse color. For example, charcoal is only 0 0.03, which when coupled with no metalness and a small amount of roughness imitates plastic materials of the darkest color. The next one is the white material, with similar caveats as the latter. Taking into consideration that fresh snow only exhibits 0 0.9 for the diffuse color, the color should be adjusted accordingly with similar values for metalness and roughness. The third material is the middle gray material, which is where we have to be careful to choose the middle gray color, but on an exponential scale. In order to understand this, we acknowledge that our eyes have receptors that distinguish the difference between dark and light areas, while having the ability to distinguish different levels of gray in between which is close to the black color. In order to adjust for this, we use only 0.18 as the middle gray instead of 0.5, generating a similar material as the rest, but having the ability to understand how middle gray range colors will interact with the light. Finally, we have to include reflections, which is when we implement the chrome material, which has metalness set to one and the roughness close to zero to allow for shiny and clear reflections. So with all these guidelines, the question remains, is it better to bake the lighting information into the textures or to reevaluate the results each time? Is the immersiveness and interaction an important factor to increase computation and rendering time? You can write your answers in the comments below. If you found this video useful, please consider subscribing as we are on our way to reach the first milestone of 1000 subscribers. I thank you for your time and hope to see you in the next video. Bye.